So before I commence my lecture for today, uh, I just want to say a few quick words about the midterm. I did send out an email to... Uh, you know, I don't send out that many emails there, uh, because I don't want to overburden you. So the ones I do send out, I hope you read uh, carefully. Um, and what I pointed out to you in, in, uh, in the email, I want to just stress that again, um, <coughs> namely that, <coughs> excuse me, namely that um, you're responsible for all the material until the end of week five. So that would be, that would include the material uh, that you're going to have in uh, the lecture on Thursday because this is week five. Uh, the midterm is a week from today, next Tuesday. Uh, you have to bring a blue book. It's an in-class exam. Uh, obviously, you cannot access any materials uh, while you're taking the exam. Uh, what is the nature of the exam? You're going to get three essay questions. Um, and the f uh, one of those essay questions is a question that all of you have to answer. So that's the first question. And then the second and the third questions, you answer one of those two. So you get some choice. Um, and you get four ID questions. Very, very short. And when I say ID question, uh, what do I mean by that? So l let's take a very simple illustration, Jallianwala Bagh, right? So what would you write that? You would say the Jallianwala Bagh massacre took place in, in India in April 1919 as a part of what are called the Punjab disturbances. Uh, there was a report that was appointed by the Congress, uh, and Mohandas Gandhi was the, was the person who, in fact, actually authored that report. Uh, and finally, uh, the third sentence that you could add, there would be something to the effect, again, all of which I have mentioned very clearly in, in one of my previous lectures, that this was the episode that finally made Gandhi aware of the fact that he could no longer support the idea of Indians having equal rights within the empire. This is what moved him to the idea of self-determination. Right? That's the importance of Jalianwala Bagh. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to answer it precisely in those three sentences. They could be somewhat different. You know, you could, you could, you could offer a different, uh, uh, you know, the last couple of sentences, but you simply have to identify what the Jallianwala Bagh is. You're not going to get Jallianwala Bagh, needless to say, as one of the four ID questions, uh, but that would be an illustration of how you would answer. Just three simple sentences so that, you know, I'm aware of the fact that, well, either you're listening to the lectures or doing the readings, uh, and, and preferably both, all right? Um, so that will be the nature of the exam. You have an hour and 15 minutes, which is the duration of the class period to write the exam. I'm going to request you to write it as legibly as you can because this is not being done on the computer. So I do have to be able to read your handwriting. Yes? How long should the essay be? As long as you think is necessary. If you think you can answer it in two pages, you write two pages. If you, if you think you need three pages, you write three pages, as in any other essay question. Uh, the qu essay questions are going to, and I'm not going to ask you something trivial uh, or peripheral to the course. So you have to think about such things as Satyagra, what is a Satyagra campaign, Ahimsa, what is Gandhi's idea of nonviolence, right? These are the kinds of things that, uh, I mean, I'm, I've spent a lot of time on Hint Swaraj and spending more time now. So, you know, you should get some hints from all of that. What am I spending more time on? Those are the things that are going to be obviously of greater importance. All right. Um, any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Plenty of them. Yeah. I mean, when I say plenty, I don't mean they're a dime a dozen, uh, because uh, as I've stressed, Fasting is a weapon of last resort. You, you try out everything else before you resort to fasting. And there were fasts which he specified that they're going to be of 21 days duration. Now those, in fact, actually are more lethal than the fasts unto death. There are three fasts unto death. Fast unto death means Gandhi says, I'm going on a fast and I'm going to continue fasting until such time as I am satisfied that, my, that I no longer have a compelling reason to fast, right? So that's potentially a fast that could go on for 50 days. But because those fasts unto death, people were obviously alarmed, right? And they're alarmed, and none of those fasts went for over a week. In fact, most of them ended in three, four, five days. But then there are fasts which he announces beforehand are of 21 days duration. 21 days, so that means he's 
he's completely off food for 21 days. And, and it doesn't matter what anyone else does or doesn't do, he's, he has to keep that fast because he's taken a vow. And so he has several of those fasts. But when we get to some other questions, including the question of relations with the lower castes and Dalits, we're going to look at one of those fasts at that juncture. All right? Okay, so uh, my agenda for today is very, is, uh, is very simply, I want to continue my discussion of Hen Swaraj, uh, and I want to look at what I have called Gandhi's critique of modernity, uh, which is embodied in Hen Swaraj, but there are a great many other texts, and of course his whole life in some ways is a testament to this particular kind of critique of modernity. And what do I mean by a critique of modernity? So that's what I'm going to be dwelling on. And then I'm going to move very briefly to a discussion of um, the political history of India uh, from 1919 after the Punjab disturbances, uh, moving through the 1930s very swiftly because, again, to reiterate a point made on previous occasions, we are not doing a comprehensive account of every campaign, nor are we looking at the whole struggle for self-determination, because that's, again, a subject really unto itself, a huge subject, but we want to look at some of the milestones, uh, and then I want to, from there, transition into what is a subject uh, for this week, and certainly will be the subject for the next lecture in its entirety, and that is Gandhi's critique of colonialism, as opposed to his critique of Western civilization and critique of modernity. Uh, and, uh, and, and at the point at which I had terminated my previous lecture, we had been discussing Hen Suraj. We had discussed the form of this particular uh, pamphlet. Um, and one of the things I'd mentioned to you, so we had looked at his diatribe against lawyers, doctors, and railways. And I'd looked in particular at his diatribe against railways. What is his critique of the railways? And you might recall that I'd shown you this map. Uh, so that you have an appreciation of how extensive the net railway network was. Uh, and pointing to some, what appear to be some anomalies or puzzles, uh, namely that even though Gandhi had a critique of the railways, he himself in fact actually used a railway system extensively, right? So you might recall this slide as well, just uh, because there has been an awareness in many other parts of the world of Gandhi's whole use of the railways. But let us now go back very briefly to some other elements of Hen Swaraj. Uh, and then uh, what I want to do is uh, I want to look uh, more closely at some philosophical aspects of the critique of modernity that you find in this particular text. So uh, the first thing uh, that I want to emphasize is the title itself is worth reflecting upon. Hind Swaraj. So the word Swaraj is comprised of, uh, if you look at this particular slide here, if you look at, if, uh, uh, if you look at this word Swa, it's a Sanskrit prefix, which means one's own, one's own. So there are a great many words such as Swadeshi. So the same prefix, Deshi, uh, would be of one's own country, self-reliance, self-reliance. So it's a Sanskrit prefix meaning one's own, and Raj means rule, rule. Hind refers to India, right? So the, the, uh, the word that is in fact used in India often for, uh, for the country is not India. That's the word that's used by anglicized elites usually. It's Hindustan, all right? The land of Hindus or Bharat. Those would be some of the other words that would be used for the country. Now when Gandhi is writing this tract called Hind Swaraj, the first thing we must understand is that it is not simply an argument for political self-determination, right? Because there is a subtitle to this work, or Indian Home Rule, right? So if you look at this pamphlet here as it was published, Hen Swaraj or Indian Home Rule. So that's the political argument, that we want independence from colonial rule or self-determination. The word independence is almost never used here. And in fact, I think in 1909, 1908, 9, when Gandhi in fact writes in Suraj, um, I think there was no Indian really who was thinking of complete independence from British rule. It, it looked like it was something on the distant horizon. Of course, 10 years made all the difference because 1919, Jallianwala Bagh, end of World War I, uh, by then Indians are going to in fact actually be demanding independence or something resembling independence. So the critical point is simply this, 
that Hen Swaraj is in fact making two arguments, arguments for two different kinds of independence. One is political independence, political self-determination, the self-determination of a people to be able to decide their own destiny. The second is rule over one's self, meaning that Gandhi is saying that before we in fact think about self-determination, political independence and all of that, we have to think about how does, how do we control ourselves? And so when he says self-rule, he means rule over your own self. How does a person, and this means that everybody has, has to wage a struggle against the baser elements of their own personality, right? Because for Gandhi, the question is, as indeed it was a question for every Indian who was searching himself or herself, the question was, how did we become enslaved as a people? After all, it's the British who colonized us. We didn't go and colonize the British, right? And the British colonized a great many other people as well. But Gandhi's interest here is obviously, how is it that Indians became enslaved? And he says that it is in part because we did not exercise a rule over ourself. So when a person surrenders to the baser elements of his or her personality, right, then that person in fact actually loses control. Now if you think of that, then you can see for example what the relationship is of that to his diatribe against doctors. Because in part the diatribe against doctors is that when a person becomes ill or diseased, you feel uncomfortable. The reason you do so very often is because you have ceased to have an understanding of your body. You have lost control over yourself, right? So you know, you indulge in things that you should not be indulging in. You indulge in, you know, eating fatty foods or overeating excessively or you indulge in alcohol or other forms of addiction and then what do you do? You go to a doctor and say, well, I've got a problem. Can you resolve this problem for me? And what Gandhi is saying that in fact actually that's an external solution. You have to rule over yourself. Okay? So this Hind Swaraj, this pamphlet, is in fact an argument not simply for political self-determination. It certainly is that. But in fact his idea of political self-determination is very different than the idea of the anarchists. Because recall the context in which this pamphlet was written, which he describes himself. That he had gone to London on a number of occasions, and in London you had these armed Indian revolutionaries who were basically saying that the way to liberate ourselves from colonial rule is to in fact indulge in acts of revolutionary violence. Right? So, the, so it's basically a debate with these people who advocate revolutionary violence, and Gandhi says no, that's not the way to do it. So of course it's an argument for nonviolence too. This tract is an argument for nonviolence, but I'm suggesting to you that if you think about the context, what Gandhi is saying is that those people who believe in revolutionary violence, they have not gone deep down and searched themselves. They have not thought about what were the limitations of each one of themselves. And what were the limitations of the Indian people that made them vulnerable to the British. Right? We were attracted by British materialism, by the materialism of Western civilization, and that is in fact our undoing, right? Because we got seduced by the glitter of the progress that Western civilization has made, or what appears to be progress, and that progress is measured by such things as railways, right? The fact that, you know, you've got modern medicine, so forth and so on. All right, so if we look at this concept of freedom, I'm saying that first, the idea of self-rule as in national self-determination that we've discussed, self-rule as in rule over oneself, controlling yourself, domesticating your anger, right? Elimination of the baser elements of yourself. And once you have done that, Gandhi argues, it is possible that in fact, India might actually become truly free. Because if we don't do that, and this is where he has one of the most brilliant lines of this particular text, right? So this is from chapter 4 
And once again, you're getting the chapters because if you're looking at a different edition, you can simply track it down. In Surah chapter 4, he says, look at this dialogue between the reader and the editor. Remember that the reader now is this imaginary person, but in fact, he represents the advocate of armed violence. That's what he represents. The editor is Gandhi himself. Reader, we may get it when we have, get it meaning self-determination, when we have the same powers as he's referring to the, uh, the white colonies such as Canada, okay? We shall then hoist our own flag. As in Japan, so must India be. What is that reference to Japan, by the way? In 1905, Japan defeated Russia. A major event in world history, from the point of view, by the way, of, of Asian uh, nationalists, and I say Asian rather than Indian, because people in China, Japan, everywhere, they were looking at this. This was a momentous event. It showed that Asia could, in fact, actually emerge as a major center of world power, right? The defeat of Russia by Japan in 1905, right? So this Indian nationalist armed advocate of revolutionary violence is saying, hey, if Japan can defeat Russia, shouldn't we take inspiration from that? Maybe we can similarly defeat the British, right? As in Japan, so must India be. We must own our own navy, our army, and we must have our own splendor. And then will India's voice ring through the world. The editor says, in response, the editor is Gandhi, you have drawn the picture well. In effect, it means that we want English rule without the Englishmen. We want English rule without the Englishmen. You want the tiger's nature, but not the tiger. That is to say you would make India English. So Gandhi is saying as a response to all of these advocates of armed violence, you know, frankly, your idea of a free India is simply an India which is exactly what it looks like right now, except that we're going to be ruled by our own despots instead of British despots, right? It's still going to be a country of inequality. It's still going to be a country where most people will not have the real freedoms. All you want to do is you want to replace the white man with the brown man, brown man, right? You want the tiger's nature, but not the tiger. That is to say, you would make India English. And when it becomes English, it will be called not Hindustan, but Englishstan. This is not the Swaraj. Swaraj meaning freedom. This is not the Swaraj that I want. All right? So you can see what, that in, what Gandhi is doing here is he, he is marking a radical departure from the kind of thinking that had obviously become predominant at that point in time. Now I think we need to add one more thing with respect to the question of Swaraj or freedom. And that is that it's very interesting that if you go to the end of this work, um, as is true of many readers and many books, people seldom get to the end of a work. You know, you read the first 20, 30 pages, and then you say, well, I think I know enough. Well, interestingly, if you go to the end of this work, it has what is called an appendix. And in the appendix, he gives you the list of all the books that he thinks you ought to read. Right? Now, virtually all of them are by Western authors. Right? But these are all Western authors who were, recall one of the earlier lectures. These are all Western authors who themselves had become marginal to the dominant Western intellectual tradition, right? So these are works by Tolstoy, but these are not the novels. The kingdom of God is within you. Then he's got Thoreau, he's got Edward Carpenter, he's got John Reskin, right? These are the authorities that he cites. The significance of that is this, that Gandhi is suggesting that one of the problems with the usual kind of nationalist, the nationalist who believes in armed violence, for example, is that these nationalists have set up a distinction between them and the British, and the British. And Gandhi is saying that the project of freedom is actually indivisible. It is not possible for us to be free until the British are free. And then, of course, someone would say, well, that sounds like a lunatic assertion because aren't the British free already? They're, after all, dominating us. And Gandhi's submission would be, no. In order for you to colonize your, someone else, you have to first colonize yourself. You first colonize yourself. You forget the finer aspects of your personality. You 
dwell upon the baser aspects. You become greedy. You become self-aggrandizing. And of course, there is, a, there is a different sense in which you colonize yourself because I want to remind you that the English did not do anything in India which they had not done with the Irish and the Scots and the Welsh. I mean, if you wanted to use people as guinea pigs, if you wanted to exploit them, the English did that first with the Irish and the Scots before they went on to India and then exploited Indians. Right? So there are many ways in which, of course, when we say that the English, in fact, colonized themselves. And Gandhi is saying that this project of independence, and remember he's writing 1908-9, this is very early. There is frankly no one in the world, I would submit, who is thinking along these lines. He's saying that when we become free, it will not simply be our freedom. The British, the English in particular, would have learned to free themselves. Because after all, the disease is with them. What is it that impels a people to go and oppress others, to go and colonize others? They need to be freed. Right? So this is, in fact, in this deceptively simple work, the radical argument that Gandhi is actually putting forward. Now I want to consider a few other aspects. Right? So we've, we've gone through this but you, you will notice that towards the end I have, is Hind Swaraj a critique of the West or of modernity, of industrial civilization, right? What exactly is it? Does he have an animus against the West? And I've already suggested to you that, well, yes, it is a critique of the West, but it's a critique of the dominant oppressive traditions of Western civilization. He does not dismiss the West in toto, right? And the best illustration of that is precisely the fact that he suggests that, look, if you really want to get an insight into some of these questions, these are the Western authors who themselves have become dissenting authors and authors who are marginal to the dominant tradition of the West. These are the authors that you should, in fact, actually read. But then, if it is not only a critique of Western civilization or of the dominant strands of Western civilization, what could we possibly mean when we say that it might be a critique of modernity? And this is what I want to spend some time on now, because Hind Swaraj, I want to argue, is fundamentally a text that takes issue with modernity. Now, what do we mean by modernity? There have been lots of people who have attempted to struggle with this term. And I don't want to spend too much time distinguishing between modernity and modernism. Modernism, for example, is a movement in the arts, right? So if you look at modernist poets, they would include people such as T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, right? And we know, of course, that there was modernism refers to a period, okay, in the history of Western art as well, right? But modernity is something quite different, and modernity is not exactly the same as modernization either. Modernization is a relatively easier concept to understand because when we say modernization, we mean the precise ways in which, for example, a country might modernize its computer, computer systems. Right? So let's say UCLA decided to modernize its computer systems. That would mean that, well, you take you know, the system that was here in existence and it's not been updated for 10 years, you modernize it. You modernize transportation networks by making your trains faster. Okay? You introduce you know, different tracking systems, so forth and so on. Now, those are the senses in which we speak of modernization. Modernity is something really quite different. Of course, modernization is a small aspect of what we mean by modernity. What is at the heart of modernity and you will see that this is the heart of Gandhi's critique in Hind Swaraj, is what we might call the urban industrial scientific vision. Right? The, the, the notion that this industrial civilization that we live in, based on the concepts of science, has all the answers to the problems that we have. That, that we are set on a course of progress, that we have, in fact, a history of humanity can be written as a history of progress. This is one of the central ideas behind modernity. Right? And of course, if you look at the way in which, in which history itself is taught, think of the temporal division. Right? What, are the, what are the 
threefold temporal division that historians use. Ancient, medieval, modern. I don't know the history of any world, any part of the world that is not written in this template. And of course, there's a very serious question about why it should be written in this particular way, because this is how Western host historians working on the history of the West decided that they would try to understand the history of the West. You basically carve up all of time into these three huge time periods. And of course, you can see that this temporal idea involved the idea of progress. You move from the ancient world to the medieval. Medieval, by the way, is not a neutral word in the English language, as I'm sure you know, because the word medieval has connotations of being backward, so forth and so on. Right? The medieval age is you know, something you've left behind, and now you've moved into something called the modern world. So this very temporal division, in fact, entailed the idea of progress. Now, I'm suggesting to you that Gandhi has this critique of this urban, urban industrial scientific vision, which is at the heart of modernity, which means, of course, among other things, that he does not accept the narrative of progress as being central to an understanding of the human condition, nor does he accept this idea that the temporal framework should be captured by something called history. History. Right? This is not supposed, something, by the way, that I'm supposed to say to you as a professor of history, but Gandhi is deeply suspicious of this whole idea of history. That the only way in which you capture the past is through history is for him a fundamental problem. Right? And you know, the most colloquial way in which I can express to you the hegemony, the absolute dominance of this idea of history is the fact that there isn't any people in this world now who wants to be told that they don't have a history. One of the things that identity politics has done on the American campus for the last four decades is to precisely have every group of people say, hey, we were left out of the history textbooks. We have our history. We want to claim that history. Right? Think of it that way. This, 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 will, this will give you a very good idea of what I mean when I say that the notion of history is something that has, in fact, dominated the modern imagination. And Gandhi is going to be deeply suspicious of that. So if you read Hind Swaraj, he says, for example, as an illustration of that, that many people have come and told him that your ideas of nonviolence are utopian because history offers no evidence that nonviolence has ever worked. He says it very clearly. And he says, in fact, actually to the contrary, nonviolence is as old as the hills. We are, in fact, naturally given to nonviolence, but we'll have to understand how violence and the whole rhetoric and language and discourse of violence became part of our consciousness. How we normalized it so that now we don't even think about the violence that is inflicted all the time in the very process of becoming actually modern, right? But when we say the critique of modernity, let's try to work through some of the ideas all of which I am suggesting to you are found in Hind Swaraj. Not necessarily in the most developed form. This is an early track. He wrote this little book, by the way, in 10 days. Okay? So it's not as though that he had a blueprint in mind and then he you know, labored over this text for three, four years. And recall once again, if, if you think that, well, it's an early text and that Gandhi abandoned these ideas, recall what I'd mentioned in my previous lecture, that Gandhi says, I stand by everything that I've written in this. He says that to the end of his life. Right? So this is what makes it important for us to understand. Now, what his arguments are. So one of the things that he's suggesting here, let's go down systematically, is that under modernity, there is a split between oneself and the subjects of one's inquiry. So I'm the researcher there, right? And I imagine that the world out there is simply has to be captured. This is the whole idea of objective social science. And Gandhi is saying this is deeply flawed. This is deeply flawed. It's not simply a matter of saying that, oh, and of course you know that the social science discipline, as it's called, which, which purports to do this, is economics more than any others. Well, there's a, there's a world out there, and we're simply going to capture it. And we're actually going to capture it on a few models, right? 
and, and what Gandhi is suggesting here is that, no, you have to first look at the subjectivity of the inquirer himself. And how do we, in fact, create this gap between the researcher and the subjects of his or her research? And you know, of course, in most contexts, it also meant, by the way, there was a hierarchical relationship. I mean, look at anthropology. Who did anthropology? It's white people studying everybody else, right? Whether you call them savages or primitives or underdeveloped or so forth and so on. Right? That's what anthropology is. It's the study of the other, and that other was always seen as existing in a hierarchical relationship to you, the superior observer of this situation. Right? And he's saying it's created a split between cognition and feeling. Okay, or between cognition, that is thought and ethics. Right? The same problem that we encountered when we look at one of the four major arguments that he had against violence itself. Right? Evasion of responsibility. What do I mean by that? One of the most common arguments, in fact, it is so common that it has become completely normalized. That's an important word for you to think about, normalized. How certain strands of thought uh, become part of the common sense of a culture and therefore are no longer questioned. Right? So one of the most common arguments, which you will see how that leads to the evasion of responsibility, is that very often, if you look, let's say you had a dispute with a, I, I have had these many times, I've had these arguments with scientists. So you have a discussion with a scientist about nuclear energy okay, and nuclear weapons. And the scientist will tell you they have a standard stock response. That, the, that nuclear weapons are an abuse. They are not the good side of science, they are the bad side of science. Okay? This is what happens when you turn scientists over to technologists. So I want to make two distinctions here. One of the ways in which science evades responsibility for what it has done is to simply say, this is a problem of technology. This is not a problem of science. There's something called pure science. This has nothing to do with the application of the science. Okay? The other way in which you evade responsibility right, is in fact by suggesting that there is something called the use and abuse of science. Okay? So nuclear energy in principle is considered to be one of the blessings. Right? Particularly now that, we, now that almost everywhere in the world they've they have understood that you need to have a critique, critique, let's say, of energy derived from such uh, uh, sources as coal, for example, right? highly polluting, okay, non-renewable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So, however, there will be those people who will say, "Well, you know, what about Hiroshima? What about Nagasaki? What about the atomic bombs that were thrown there? What about the fact that there is always this threat?" And the argument is that, yeah, but you know, that's the abuse. That, or that science can have inadvertent consequences. And Gandhi is saying that one of the problems is that this always leads to the evasion of responsibility. Now, I was having a discussion with a friend the other day, a, a, very, a, a major scholar, uh, and he gave a very interesting illustration of that. That if I asked all of you, you know, and I'm, some of you would know the answer, who invented penicillin? You know, some people here would say, yeah, we know the answer. The answer is Sir Alexander Fleming, okay? Because penicillin is something that is supposedly good, that it, 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 it you, you know, new generation of antibiotics for that time, et cetera, et cetera. So if I asked you who invented Zyklon B, how many of you know what Zyklon B is, by the way? You do, I know, yeah. What, what Zyklon B? Yeah, so it's a gas that was used by the Nazis, okay, at places like Auschwitz. So who invented Zyklon B? Does anybody know? I can tell you, you can go to a million scientists and none of them know who invented Zyklon B. Because you, no scientist wants to take responsibility for having invented Zyklon B, but someone did. You want to take responsibility for penicillin, and so therefore every schoolboy and schoolgirl in India had to learn that, yes, and over here in the West, that this is the inventor of 
penicillin. Who invented napalm? Right? Agent Orange. And I can tell you once again, you can ask a million scientists and none of them knows. Right? Because why? That's something that was done by the state. You know, that was done something by the state. You see, these are ways of evading responsibility. And Gandhi is saying that you have to be responsible even for the unintended consequences. Right? I mean, every American war that is waged, they'll say, well, you know, there's a phrase for unintended consequences made infamous by people like Rumsfeld. It was called collateral damage. So when the bombs are falling on Iraq and thousands of children are being killed, the American government's view was this is collateral damage. This happens. Stuff happens, as Rumsfeld once said. Stuff happens. In other words, but that, you know, those are the unintended consequences, but we can't do anything about it. Gandhi is saying, no, that is the problem of modernity. And someone here might say, well, wasn't that the case in the 13th century or the 14th century? Why is this modernity? And Gandhi is saying, no, in fact, this kind of evasion of responsibility is a characteristic feature of the modern condition and how we've developed. Because you have to have that split between yourself. You're the researcher. I'm developing this gas. And frankly, those people out there are just guinea pigs. Why do I need to worry about the ethical consequences of what I do? Right? So this is what I mean when I speak about such things as evasion of responsibility. Modernity reduces temporal understanding to history, something I've already suggested to you. Place to space. I want to consider that for a minute. You see, most people, before the advent of modernity, had a specific relationship to a place. Place and space are two very different words and two very different geographical concepts. A place is always a locale. You have a relationship to it. And you know, one doesn't have to romanticize the Native Americans or Indians, first Americans, whichever phrase you prefer, okay, one doesn't have to romanticize them to understand that one reason why there has been acute unhappiness on the part of Native Americans for 400, 450 years, I'm putting it very mildly when I say acute unhappiness because most of them, of course, were wiped out in, in repeated genocides, right? But it has to do with the fact that all of these people had a particular relationship to the land. Land was not something that you alienated. Alienated here is a concept meaning it's not something that you can just sell. It's not disposable. It's not simply another transaction. Okay? You had a specific relationship. You had a relationship to the soil <coughs> on which you were raised, from which you gathered your vegetables. That people knew where the food was coming from. Under conditions of modernity, what happens is place gets eviscerated. It gets wiped out. What you get is a generic space, a generic space. And of course, that's one of the conditions of colonialism, that people lose their particular attachment to a place, to a locale. And cease to think of it as sacred, for example. Right? And each of these ideas, by the way, is a subject of a book. And there are dozens of books on each of these. So I'm just encapsulating it very briefly because I'm suggesting to you that the germs of all of these ideas, in fact, actually are to be found in this little treatise called Hind Suraj. And that might make you better understand why he has this critique of all of these institutions and practices. Under modernity, legislative dicta rather than conscience determines the moral values of a people. Institutions can never be so good that it becomes unnecessary for individuals to be good. See, Gandhi is saying that what we have done is we have now, this is another form of evasion of responsibility. We have passed on the responsibility to institutions. So a child does not okay, flower or develop, right? in certain ways. 
you immediately then think of all the institutions that are responsible for that. Right? Well, maybe the social services failed, and maybe the schools failed our kids. I'm giving you the most, most common form of that, the most common form of that. The, the, other, the other end of it is that we don't need, really need to worry about the laws that we have because we have legislators, people we have elected. They will do that work for us. Right? So therefore, we don't even have to worry about whether we're good or not. And Gandhi is saying no matter how good the institutions, no matter how good your schools, no matter how good your psychiatric institutions, your hospitals, that will never relieve an individual of the responsibility to be good. And that simply having legislatures pass dicta. So what would be a dicta? Let me give you the clearest example in case some of you are still thinking, what is this about? Okay, let me give you a simple illustration. Legislative dicta would be that a law is passed saying you cannot discriminate against a person on the basis of his or her color, right? You cannot discriminate against a person on the basis of his or her color. Now, simply because you have passed that law, does that mean that you cease to think about what that really means? Because inwardly, you might think to yourself, I hate that person. I, I hate all black people, or I hate all white people. I mean, there are people, after all, who have racial hatred. We know that. So simply because a legislative dicta says that this is what you have to do. This is, of course, a problem with diversity. And multiculturalism, the university every day is going to pass a little rule. Let's respect diversity. Now they even have a diversity requirement, right? All of you have to fulfill a diversity requirement, Many, meaning that you must do one course now during the four years that you're here where you learn about the diversity. But this is a rule coming from the top. It's not an organic decision on your part. And the state is saying, whether you like it or not, we're telling you this is good for you. Right? So therefore, what Gandhi is saying is that this is a specific feature of modernity. That the idea that you don't have to exercise your own conscience. In fact, there are others who are going to tell you what is in fact actually desirable. Of course, the Republican opposition to this is not coming from these grounds. It's coming from different grounds. They simply don't like state regulation and period, except when it suits their purposes, right? <clears throat> because of course, we know that there has been a considerable expansion <clears throat> of the US government under Republican administrations. So, the, so I don't want you to, I'm, why am I bringing this in right now? Because I don't want you to even remotely confuse what he's saying for a kind of a Republican position that you might find in the United States today. Right? It is not a kind of possessive individualism that Gandhi is really speaking about, where he's saying that, oh, every individual should simply be able to do what he or she wants to do. No. In fact, one of the problems with modernity is the fact that it does not recognize what we might call restraints or limits. Right? That modernity knows no restraints or limit, and this is where you can see the critique of the railways. Because think of it this way. I'm going to tie in another idea, <coughs> which will also touch upon my own article. Let's look at it this way. Let me give you an illustration. So I came to Los Angeles. I joined the faculty here, <coughs> excuse me, in 93. And since the time that I've been here, I've been hearing about a particular issue that they were trying to resolve. Uh, I need a drink of water here. Just give me a minute. OK, so that particular problem <coughs> is that uh, Los Angeles has always had to worry about traffic problems. Okay, So now, how do you address this particular issue of traffic problems? So you tinker with the system. What does tinkering with the system mean? 
It means that, for example, you decide that you're going to add a carpool lane. You're going to add a carpool lane, right? So you've got four lanes. Let's make one of them a carpool lane. In some cities in the US, um, they have a variation of that. They have a reversible lane, okay? which means that <coughs> depending on the, on the flow of traffic in the morning and evening, you, know, you can add an extra lane because you know the traffic is all going downtown. So you get five lanes, and then coming back, it becomes three lanes. You take one lane away. Okay? Those are all forms of tinkering with the system. The other way with you tinker with this is you say that, well, what we're going to do is we're going to obviously add more freeways. Right? For about six, seven years, they were working on the 405. I have no idea what they did, because I've been going down the 405. And after six, seven years and $1.5 billion, I'm not sure that I've seen an iota of difference, okay? an iota of difference. Okay, and we won't speak here about the inefficiency, because I know in China they would have done exactly the same thing in three months. But of course, they wouldn't have worried about environmental rules and regulations in China, because that's what it means to be an authoritarian state. You don't need to worry about those things. Right? But you see what I mean, right? You tinker with the system. And you keep on having these discussions. Now, what would a Gandhian reading be? Let's supposing you got this on your, on your midterm. What would a Gandhian reading of this situation be, keeping in mind what he says in Hind Swaraj? Right? The first thing we'd have to think about is, since when has it become the norm in human history for people to commute daily 5, 10, 15, 25, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 miles? You know, my wife has, has colleagues who live in Irvine. And they take the van pool, which picks them up at 3.30 at night. 3.30. Because that's the only way you can get to UCLA if you're coming from there in a carpool and make sure that you don't hit any traffic. Okay? And that, again, is tinkering with the system. Okay? You get, you get carpools. Right? You know, initially when the hybrid... Toyota, when the Prius, initially, I'm talking about the very, about 10 years ago, when the Prius first came on the streets, I don't know how many of you know, the Prius was exempt from the carpool regulation. You, the, a, a single person in a Prius could go in a carpool lane for three years. Yes. Because you were driving a hybrid, so therefore you were more progressive and you were saving on gas, etc., etc. Now, you see what I'm, what we're, what's happening. I'm giving you five, or five different scenarios of how you tinker with the problem. Because, of course, fundamentally, what you'd have to say to yourself is the only way to really address this issue is the following. Two options. The second is so radical that we can't even think about it. Even in America, even the first is radical, extraordinarily radical, which is you... You hike up the price of gas to $10 a gallon, which is what it is, by the way, in countries such as Turkey and Great Britain. It's about $8 or $9 a gallon. Because you create a serious disincentive for people to drive. A serious disincentive, right? Of course, you know, if you are born in a country where you think that your right to gas is like right to water, it's going to be hard to do that. But that would mean where you say, all right, because if you do that, then you say to yourself, that's more than tinkering, because it's an incentive for the state to think about having mass transit systems that actually work. That actually work. Right? Because that is, of course, a problem with most American cities. They don't have adequate mass transit systems. I mean, as a, a, the greater Los Angeles area, if you ever compare it with Shanghai or Beijing or Tokyo, I mean, those cities have mass transit systems like you've never seen. Right? That would be one solution. That would take some time, but that would be one solution, where you say that you basically make it difficult or impossible or prohibitively expensive for everyone to be out in their cars. 
However, Gandhi would say that that's simply an improved form of tinkering. The real ecological view of this would be, since by beginning to ask, since when in human history have people lived so far from where they work? Number one. If we had integrated notions of community where all the people or the majority of the people all actually worked, had their leisure activities and their residents all within the same area, it would obviously obviate, preclude the necessity of having to do these commutes. Okay? And we know, by the way, that there are even people who commute by plane. You know, you, I mean, it's a small minority, but there are people who live in LA and they f fly to the Bay Area three or four times a week, or vice versa. Right? That's how they structured their lives. Now, think of it this way. One of the things that Gandhi is saying, because go back to the critique of railways. And I was saying to you that, well, you know, Gandhi himself uses the railways extensively, and so one can point to that puzzle or conundrum, but that doesn't still tell us what is at the heart of that critique of the railways. And what is at the heart of that critique of railways is number one, this idea that we do not have to think of integrated communities anymore. And in fact, that's what railways and airplanes do, right? They they shorten your travel time, they increase the distance that you can cover. So what happens, by the way, place becomes slowly rendered into a generic space. They introduce the notion of speed, and I recall that in my last comment I mentioned that to you, that there is a critique of speed, because what Gandhi, in fact, argues is that one of the characteristic problems of modernity is it's addicted to speed. And you can see that in every act of your life today. I mean, the whole endeavor in Apple, Microsoft, let's just increase the speed with which you can download your email. The speed with which you can download a video, you know, it becomes a micro, you know, 0 0.001 of a second, right? I mean, I, that, that's a constant argument that you hear. We're just improving it, right? The speed with which things happen. And Gandhi's critique here is that, in fact, it is essential that we slow down. Because when we slow down, we get a chance to not only reflect, but we break down this distinction between things like work and leisure, for example. And one of the, again, one of the common problems of modernity. And I've heard this from so many people, you know, people who go on a vacation. And when they come back from the vacation, they need another one. They're so stressed out from having to plan the vacation, plot it, right? Because the overarching framework within which you're working is something called work. Something called work. And Gandhi is saying that, in fact, this is not how people actually thought of their lives for centuries. This idea that you say, oh, this is work, this is play, this is leisure, this is quality family time, right? This is a characteristic feature of how we compartmentalize things. You see, there's an integrated criticism here because now he's looking at a critique of speed. He's looking at the fact that the railways alienate you from yourself. And he was asked a question, well, if you're opposed to machinery, how come you're not opposed to the bicycle? And Gandhi said, well, it's very simple. You have to exercise your body to use the bicycle. You get to know your body. You get to know your body's strengths and weaknesses. You don't have a passive relationship with this thing called a bicycle. Right? Gandhi doesn't, it's not that Gandhi is opposed to all technology. That's what it might seem like from a casual reading of Hind Swaraj. He has a sustained critique of the ways in which certain forms of 
technology, machinery have alienated us, have introduced considerations in life which we are not morally qualified to grapple with. Right? That if I had to use a kind of a cliche from some of the arguments that have been made in recent years that the speed with which technology has gone forward has left behind humans in their ability to morally grapple with those questions. That our moral thinking has not gone at the same speed with which technology has gone. Right? So that has created a big disjuncture between humans and the technologies that they employ. Right? That is what in effect he is really talking about when he is looking at such things as, if you look at that point from there, imposes no restraints or limits upon itself. Right? And I want to conclude this discussion with the point that you find towards the end, a technicist managerial solution to problem. One of the fundamental characteristics of modernity and of the scientific worldview is the argument that all the problems that have been created by science can be resolved by science. Gandhi does not accept this at all. Right? That is what he calls the technicist view of life. The technicist view of life is, okay, we've, that all of these technological advances have created certain problems. Right? And the technicist view will simply say that the way to address these is actually by better technology or a different technology. But that we don't, we don't have to go outside the framework of technology to solve our problems. And if you read that article that was assigned to you, uh, called Gandhi's Critique of the West from Outside the Imperium for week four. So here Ashish Nandi quotes one of the more well-known exponents of that view. Let me end this discussion with that view. Peter Medaver, who said, I quote, the deterioration of the environment, the deterioration of the environment produced by technology. Simple example. Massive use of air conditioning, right? That's a technology, and it's led to the deterioration. I think we would all agree, right? Okay? The deterioration of the environment produced by technology. That's one illustration. Obviously, cars, right? Is a technological problem of which technology has found, is finding, and will continue to find solutions, end quote. I mean, if you had to render it layman's language, what would it mean? Peter Medaver is saying, well, yeah, these air conditioners have produced, have contributed, massive use of air conditioners all over the world has contributed to global warming. But that's not a problem. We'll just come up with better air conditioners. That's all we need to do. Find more energy efficient air conditioners, you know, and that's what the whole last 30, 40 years, whether it's washing machines, air conditioners, you name it, we'll just produce more efficient air conditioners. That's the technicist solution. That's a char characteristically modern way of thinking about our problems. And what Hind Swaraj is doing is offering a sustained critique of this whole model. Okay, So this text, which I urge you to read not just for the purposes of this class, but to think about it and to go back at back to this text a few years later even, is to see exactly what are the insights that it has into what we might call the human condition. Any questions before I move on very briefly to the political history? Yes. Can you, can you repeat the question once again? Like, the whole point of Hindu Swaraj is he's saying that people shouldn't rely on technology. 
that yes. Exists. Yeah. So, what would, how would he have applied that to like the way India formed the democracy after ah. the <coughs> Oh, look, I mean, that has so many dimensions because the easiest way to answer that is to say that none of Gandhi's, it was a question that was asked at the outset of the class, actually, it's a similar question in that way, that none of the insights that Gandhi has were ever taken up by India after independence. So when you're think, when you're, the question is, well, how does India as a democracy grapple with, right, with question, the answer very simply is it doesn't. It has adopted lock, stock, and barrel, the dominant model. And of course, you have dissenters, right? That's something that we'll cover later on when we look at people who have, who have, in fact, actually adopted some of these ideas and taken them in quite radical directions, right? But insofar as the Indian state is concerned, this is just simply an abstract treatise. Because why should we imagine that simply because Gandhi is from India that the Indian state would act any differently? Because the very idea of the Indian state is itself modeled on the idea of the nation state. So then we would have to look at the whole nation state system, right? which we will. In the concluding weeks, if you look at the syllabus, you'll see I have a little section called the whole idea of the nation state and its problems. because. Fundamentally, of course, a nation state is completely addicted to the, the dominant model. Progress, science, development, the whole jargon. Right? But that's the simplest way to, to answer that, that. But I want to be certain that you don't understand me mean, mean to mean that they aren't people who, of their own will and choice, who have not, in fact, actually already adopted some of these ideas. And, and we would have to look at such things as ecological movements in India, for example, to see how some of Gandhi's ideas have been taken up, you know? particularly with respect to questions of technology, how people in many places have simplified their lives, have simplified their lives. People who have deliberately chosen to stay close to where they work, precisely because they realize that if you're going to have an ecological perspective, the ecological perspective doesn't involve tinkering with the system. That's what environmentalists do. You tinker with the system. The ecological problem, the ecological solution would require you to have not just an integrated view, but to search deep down into the, your notion of the self, what you understand by the community, and how one then locates oneself in relationship to something called a community. All right, now, very briefly. So the political history of India at the point at which we had ended was 1919. And I'd mentioned to you that at that point that Gandhi, in fact, actually is going to launch this whole movement against the Rowlett Acts, remember? Uh, so this is the Rowlett Satyagraha, which in turn is going to lead to what is called the non-cooperation movement. We'll look very briefly at what are some of the elements of the non-cooperation movement. Um, but if you had to, I mean, and I posted the slides, by the way, if you had to look at some of the major uh, incidents or movements, then these are the things that we would have to look at. Gandhi's trial, which we'll look at in my next lecture, because I'm going to look at Gandhi's critique of colonialism, right? Um, and we're going to look at Gandhi's letter to the Viceroy written in 1930, so that will enable us to have an understanding of what is called the Salt Satyagraha. The last major movement is going to be under Gandhi's leadership in a way is going to be the Quit India Movement, 1942 to 44, and that will then eventually pave the way for independence in 1947. Okay. Um, recall also, before we get into this political history in great detail, I want to give you one very interesting illustration. So I pointed to the fact that when Gandhi came back, on a number of occasions when Gandhi came back from South Africa to India in 1915, he was not really a known entity. And the question I had posed for you, um, a question which I have mentioned has not been satisfactorily resolved from my point of view, despite the voluminous literature, is how did Gandhi actually acquire 
the leadership of the Indian nationalist movement in such a short period of time. And this one year, what difference did this one year make? 1919 is when he starts to become really prominent nationally. And then by 1920, he is the Mahatma. He has been transformed into the Mahatma, the great soul. And to give you that illustration of that difference that one year can make, as it were, if you look at the 1919 Indian yearbook, who's who in India, Gandhi is not even mentioned. He's not even mentioned in who's who in India, right? And then in 1920, you finally get an entry, and he is described. Look at the entry. Think about it. We're going to encounter this again later on. He's described as someone who had practiced law in Indian South Africa and was, quote, now occupied in farming and weaving. Farming and weaving. This is the Indian yearbook for 1920 entry for Mohandas Gandhi. Right? So how is a farmer and weaver going to lead the nation? What kind of web did he weave that drew everyone into this struggle in such a short period of time? Right? That's the question that we're going to address in yet a different manner. We've already addressed it, but we're going to continue to address that question. Right? So 1920, because remember 1920 is that yearbook entry now, that's the year when Gandhi launches the non-cooperation movement. And I've described to you the circumstances under which he la launched it. World War I had ended in 1918. The British had promised that there would be a greater degree of self-determination, not independence, but that Indians would have a greater hand in determining their own destiny to some degree. More of them would be admitted into the civil services, for example. And in fact, quite to the contrary, the government of India, the British government of India, passed the Defense of India rules, which basically stripped people of some of their constitutional rights. Not that they had very many to begin with as a colonized people. But, but the British are conducting a regime of law and order in some sense. So there are some constitutional provisions, right? And there's this committee that's appointed, the Revolutionary Conspiracies in India Committee, and then they are the one, the, the report of the committee is going to recommend that that a draconian regime be, be uh, installed in India to contain revolutionary conspiracies, right? So, and it's in response to that that Gandhi had then launched a day of prayer and resistance and you had the Jallianwala Bagh. But what are the key elements of what is called the non-cooperation movement? What does non-cooperation mean? It means effectively that you say, I am not, I as an Indian, whoever I may be, I am not going to accept the authority of British rule. I am going to cease to send my children to British run schools. I'm not going to buy British produced textiles, right? If the British government has conferred an honor on me, I will return it to them. Because by taking an honor from the government, I in fact accept the legitimacy of the British, right? In other words, what non corporation seeks to do is to make British rule look illegitimate in India, right? And in the most extensive sense of the term, what it meant was it actually paralyzed British administration. If you read the archival records, it is very clear that by 1921, the non-cooperation movement begins mid-1920, ends in early 1922. And if you read the archival records, you know that by mid-1921, they were places where the British admitted. And when I say archival records, I'm talking about the correspondence between British officials and the government of India. Right? You go into the archives, much of which has not been published, you know, where, where the senior official is being informed by his junior officials about the status of the British administration in that province or that district. And where those junior officials admit to the senior officials, frankly, the government is paralyzed. Because in order for the British government to work in India, a large number of Indians had to be collaborating in British rule. The senior officials are all British, but who's the one, who are the ones who are pushing the files? 
When the senior official needs a file because he has to make a decision, he's got 10 Indians working in the lower positions. What if all of these people cease to come to work? That's what non-cooperation means. Right? And what the archival records show is in fact that the British government in certain parts of India had become paralyzed. If you had to look at it in a different language, it is the withdrawal of the consent of the governed. Right? Because tacitly, no system of oppression is possible. None. Without, in some ways, the consent of the governed. That consent may be completely tacit. The, those who are being governed might think they don't even have the choice of that consent. But every form of oppression is a pact, an unwritten pact between the oppressor and the oppressed. And Gandhi's injunction in this movement was you non-cooperate. But this did not entail use of violence. And in fact, we're going to find my concluding remark for today before we look at Gandhi's critique of colonialism on Thursday, right? In fact, Gandhi's injunction always was that this non-cooperation movement cannot be accompanied by violence. In fact, if you commit violence, you're actually cooperating with the British. Why so? Because the only language that the British understand is a language of violence. So you are becoming complicit in that system. Right? And we're going to see under what circumstances Gandhi decided to suspend the non-cooperation movement and his subsequent trial immediately thereafter by the British. He's going to be in prison. And then in that speech that he gives, which I want you to read for Thursday, which is in that pamphlet that I sent you as an attachment, Right? He is going to give a withering indictment of colonial rule in India. So that and the letter to the Viceroy 1930, those are the, going to be the two principal texts for Thursday. And I urge you to read them before you come to class so that you can understand exactly what is transpiring there. Okay?